The grandeur of that evening had been palpable, the air within the ancient walls of the theater vibrating with anticipation for the classical music concert. As a violinist, I, Sebastian, had always found solace in the intricate melodies and harmonious symphonies that filled such spaces. Music was not just my profession, it was my sanctuary, my connection to the world beyond the notes on the page. The concert had commenced with the swelling of strings that day, the air resonating with the collective breaths of an enraptured audience. Our ensemble, a blend of seasoned musicians and prodigious talents, played with a fervor that belied the years of rigorous training and dedication to our craft. It was during the second movement, a delicate adagio, that the harmony was shattered. The sharp, discordant crack of gunfire echoed through the hall, a malevolent intrusion that turned the music into a cacophony of screams and chaos. From my position on stage, I watched in horror as confusion and panic swept through the concert goers. The surreal nightmare unfolded in slow motion, my brain struggling to process the reality of the situation. Sebastian, we need to get off stage now, whispered Anna, the first violinist, her eyes wide with fear. But I couldn't move, paralyzed not by fear, but by an overwhelming sense of responsibility. These were our patrons, our fans, the lifeblood of the arts, and they were under attack in our sanctuary. The gunfire ceased momentarily, replaced by the sound of heavy footsteps and labored breathing. The shooter was moving through the theater, his presence an ominous specter haunting the once hollowed halls. In that moment of eerie silence, a plan formed in my mind. I knew the theater like the back of my hand, every nook and cranny, every passage used by performers or yesteryears. If anyone could navigate through this chaos, it was me. Anna, tell everyone to hide. I'm going to try and stop him. I said, my voice steadier than I felt. Sebastian, are you insane? You can't- I know this place, Anna. It's our best chance. Call the police and stay hidden until I come back. Without waiting for her response, I slipped off stage, moving with purpose through the backstage corridors. My heart pounded in my chest, a frenetic tempo that matched my quickening pace as I maneuvered through the labyrinthian passageways. The sound of the gunman's movements guided me, a sinister symphony that I followed, driven by a resolve I hadn't known I possessed. As I neared, the reality of what I was about to do set in. I was no hero just a musician. Yet, here I was, chasing down a madman in a deadly game of cat and mouse. The backstage area was dimly lit, the shadows my only concealment as I spotted the gunman reloading his weapon. His back was to me, a momentary vulnerability that I seized, launching myself at him with a makeshift weapon in hand, a piece of broken stage equipment I'd grabbed along the way. The collision set us tumbling to the ground, the gun skittering away into the darkness. What followed was a blur of motion, a desperate struggle for survival. Every self-defense class I'd reluctantly attended, every bit of strength I possessed, was funneled into that moment. I'm not gonna let you destroy what we've built here, I gasped, my voice a mix of determination and fear as we grappled on the cold, hard floor. The gunman fought back with a surprising ferocity, his own determination evident in his movements. But the advantage was mine, fueled by adrenaline and the intimate knowledge of the terrain. As our struggle continued, I couldn't help but wonder how we had arrived at this point. What series of events had led this individual to disrupt a celebration of art with violence and terror? The answer, I feared, would not be a simple one. But in that moment, all that mattered was stopping him, ensuring the safety of those who had come to share in the beauty of music, only to find themselves caught in a nightmare. The struggle seemed to stretch into eternity, each second a lifetime of effort and fear. The gunman was strong, his desperation lending him a wild, unpredictable strength that was difficult to counter. But I had something more powerful on my side a determination born of love for my art and the sacred space it inhabited. 
This theater was more than just bricks and mortar. It was a sanctuary for those who believed in the transformative power of music. I could not, would not, let this man desecrate it further. As we fought, I realized that the piece of broken stage equipment I had wielded as a weapon was now pressing against his throat. It was a metal rod, part of a stand that had snapped during the initial chaos. With every ounce of strength left in me, I pressed it against him, pinning him down with a leverage I scarcely knew I possessed. Stop this madness! I hissed, my breath ragged from the exertion. Why are you doing this? For a moment, his eyes met mine, and in them I saw not the ferocity of a predator, but the desperation of a man cornered by his own demons. He was skinny, not much stronger than myself. He wasn't a seasoned attacker or a mercenary. That I was sure of, else he'd have pinned me down in an instant. But then, what pushed him to do this? He gasped for air, struggling behind my hold, but the fight was going out of him, his strength waning. It was then that the sound of approaching footsteps echoed through the backstage area, the cavalry arriving in the form of theater security and police officers, their voices loud and authoritative. The gunman went limp beneath me, his surrender silent but unmistakable. Officers quickly took over, handcuffing the man and dragging him to his feet. As they led him away, one of the officers stayed behind, a look of incredulity on his face. You're lucky to be alive, he said, his voice a mixture of admiration and reprimand. What made you think you could take him on, son? I shrugged, the adrenaline fading, leaving exhaustion in its wake. I know this place. It's part of me, and I couldn't stand by and watch it be destroyed. As the police secured the scene and paramedics attended to the wounded, I found myself surrounded by my fellow musicians, their faces a tapestry of relief and trauma. Anna approached, her eyes shining with unshed tears. You're insane, Sebastian, she said, but her voice was thick with gratitude. But thank you. In the days that followed, the events of that night became a blur a nightmare recounted by news reports and whispered conversations. The gunman, it was revealed, had no connection to a theater or the orchestra. His motives were attributed to misplaced rage against the rich, a narrative all too common in the stories that dominate our headlines. The concert hall, once a place of pure artistic pursuit, had become a battleground, a stark reminder of the fragility of the spaces we hold dear, But in the aftermath, as the community rallied to reclaim and restore the sanctity of our theater, I realized that music's power transcends even the darkest of moments. We held a concert not long after, a tribute to the resilience of the human spirit and the unifying power of music. As I took the stage, my violin in hand, I felt a profound connection to every person in that room. The notes we played that night were more than just melodies. They were a declaration of our refusal to be silenced by fear. The festival was supposed to be an escape, a place to lose oneself in the crowd and the cacophony of sounds that promised a reprieve from the haunting silence of my own thoughts. My name is Casey, and if you had told me that my search for solace would lead me down a path of psychological unraveling, I would have laughed. But there I was, standing at the precipice of my own mind, teetering on the edge of sanity. The day had started like any other at the festival, with the air electric with anticipation and the ground vibrating with bass. I wandered aimlessly, a solitary figure amongst a sea of faces, until a stranger caught my eye. He was an oddity, not for his appearance, which was unremarkable, but for the way he seemed to move through the crowd, untouched and unnoticed. Looking for an experience? He asked, his voice barely audible over the music. I nodded, curiosity peaked. He handed me a small, unassuming pill, its surface shimmering with a promise of escape. This'll sink you to the music, but be warned, it's not for the faint of heart. I swallowed the pill without a second thought, a decision that would come to haunt me. Anything that would let me forget the tragedy I'd faced recently, anything that could promise to pull me away and silence the thousand negative thoughts battering my mind at all times, 
I would take it. As the chemicals coursed through my veins, the world around me began to distort, the music transforming into a pulsating entity that breathed life into my darkest fears. The festival's landscape morphed before my eyes, the once vibrant scene now a nightmarish tableau of shadows and whispers. Each note of the music tugged at the strings of my soul, unraveling them with surgical precision. I was no longer a spectator. I was a part of the concert, the music weaving through me, carrying me on a tide of emotions I couldn't control. Then came the visions, vivid and terrifying. They crashed over me like waves, each one a memory of the tragedy that had sent me spiraling into despair. In one moment, every face I came across resembled me. Then a few people started floating in the air, each of them singing a song in a language I didn't know. I was back there, in the moment that had shattered my world, surrounded by the chaos and the screams that had echoed through my dreams ever since. I tried to run, to tear myself away from the visions that clawed at my sanity. But the music was relentless, a siren call that I couldn't escape. It whispered of guilt, of secrets buried deep within my psyche, secrets I had tried so hard to forget. Help me. I heard myself cry out, but I did not say it. Then how was I hearing my own voice? And then, when I tried to speak, my voice was lost in the cacophony, just another note in the symphony of terror that enveloped me. Around me, the festival goers continued to dance, oblivious to the struggle that raged within me. As the night wore on, the line between reality and the drug-induced nightmare began to blur, the visions becoming indistinguishable for the world around me. I was trapped in a loop of fear and confusion each moment stretching into eternity. It was in this state of turmoil that I found myself confronted with the most chilling vision yet. A figure cloaked in shadows, its features obscured but its intent clear. It reached for me, a gesture that spoke of unspeakable horrors, and I knew, with a clarity that cut through the fog of my mind, that I was facing the manifestation of my own guilt. The music, now a cacophony of screams and dissonance, reached a crescendo, and I braced myself for the final plunge into madness. But it was then, at the edge of despair, that a hand found mine, pulling me back from the brink. The hand that pulled me back from the abyss felt real, grounding, amidst the swirling chaos of my own mind. Blinking against the harsh lights of the festival, I found myself staring into the concerned eyes of a friend, Maya, who had been searching for me after I'd vanished into the crowd. Casey, are you okay? You're scaring me. She said, her voice laced with genuine worry. Her presence was a lifeline, a beacon of reality in the tempest of my mind. I tried to articulate what I was experiencing, but how could I explain the unexplainable? The music still played, a relentless force, but Maya's intervention had somehow lessened its hold over me. I... I took something. I managed to say, my voice trembling. It's making me see things. Horrible things. Maya's eyes widened with understanding and concern. We need to get you out of here, now. She decided, her tone leaving no room for argument. As we made our way through the festival grounds, the visions continued to assault me, though now intersped with moments of clarity. The crowd around me felt oppressive, each face a mask of judgment, each step a journey through my deepest fears. But Maya's presence was a constant, a reminder of the world beyond my psychedelic-induced nightmare. By the time we reached the relative safety of the camping area, the worst of the visions had begun to fade, leaving behind a residue of terror and a profound sense of vulnerability. In the silence of the early morning, with Maya by my side, I began to unravel the threads of my experience. The psychedelic journey had not been an escape, but a confrontation with the trauma I had tried so desperately to bury. The tragedy that had taken a loved one, leaving a void filled with guilt and unanswered questions. Why did I see those things, Maya? Why did it feel so real? I asked, the words heavy with the weight of my confusion. 
Maya took a moment before answering, her gaze thoughtful. Sometimes our minds find ways to confront us with our fears, our guilt. Maybe this was your mind's way of forcing you to face what happened, to start healing. And that's when I remembered. Maya was dead. We were in a car accident due to my recklessness, and this was the manner in which my guilt manifested to confront me. The visions, the terror, the relentless music, they were manifestations of my own psyche, a landscape shaped by my unresolved grief and guilt. And then my vision cleared, and then Maya vanished before my eyes. When I woke up, I was in a hospital. They told me that it had almost been two weeks that I was in a coma. As it turned out, the mystery man who had handed out the psychedelics was traced and he was given those substances by Dr. Johnson, my therapist, along with ten other people who were at the concert. He had performed suggestive instigation to send us to the concert and had the man give us a concoction he had brewed to illegally test his new healing therapy on his patients without them knowing. Of the ten patients, three suffered cardiac arrest while the rest of us ended up in coma in the hospital. He was arrested and the scandal broke out before I even woke up again. But the weird thing was that I I felt better. Much better. The confrontation with my friend Maya had given me some sort of closure and I knew that my healing journey had begun. I felt much lighter probably smiled for the first time in months as I saw my parents reaching to hug me. Dr. Johnson was arrested. His manner was illegal and harmful, yet it healed me of my trauma. Weird. 